This episode of Trifles is brought to you by the BSI Press. Manuscripts, collections of papers by international writers, and books covering a wide range of other Sherlockian topics. Find them online at bakerstreetirregulars.com. Welcome to Trifles, a weekly podcast about the Sherlock Holmes stories. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Yes, the lip was twisted, the soldier was blanched, and the men were dancing, but there are so many other details to pick apart in the stories. Pray, be precise as to details. You know the plots, but what about the minutia? Have you ever stopped to wonder about whatever happened to Inspector Gregson? Or Mrs. Hudson's husband? Or of Holmes's early clients? You are very inquisitive, Mr. Holmes. It is my business to know what other people don't know. Scott Monty and Bert Wolder will have the answers to these questions and more in Trifles. The game's afoot. Episode 225. Vipers, or wipers. Hello and welcome to Trifles, the Sherlock Holmes podcast where we talk about the details in the stories. I'm Scott Monty. I'm Bert Walden. And Bert, I hope you are not viped out. Or is that wiped out? <laughs> I've just been viping my eyeglasses, and that's one of the reasons why they're still quite dirty. What have I been doing? Oh, Strange. my goodness. Well, maybe too much vaping. Or is that waping? <laughs> I'm not sure. Either way, you can find the show notes for this episode at ihose.co slash trifles225. That will take you directly to the page on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com, where we cover all of the show notes that you might need any links any necessary um information about our sponsors etc check it out and you can also follow us on all the socials there you can uh, support the show via paypal or patreon more information about back episodes and all of that so check it out meanwhile let's get on with it shall we Well, this is that time of the month in the episodes where we talk about some kind of animal in the canon. And in 2021, in Season 5, we have been talking about exotic animals. Uh, we've covered cheetahs and baboons and, uh, oh gosh, lemurs and, um, oh. Mongoose. Mongoose, mongooses, all of those. So, um, you know, we didn't point out that, of course, mongoose, mongoose is a French term. Mongoose, your goose, ultra goose. <laughs> you know, the other day online, I saw a picture of a, a man holding a goose, and, and the man, there was a bubble over his head. He said, I'm more of a people person. And the goose said, I'm more of a geese goose. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, um, it, not lemurs, it was langurs. Sorry about that. My, my error there. So this time, we're going to talk about vipers, or as it appears in the canon, wiper. Now, okay, we'll get to the linguistics in just a bit, but where do we find, Bert, the possibility of the mention of a viper anywhere in the canon? I mean, we, we know the, the swamp adder from the speckled band, but where does a viper make its appearance? Well, there are linguistic appearances of the word viper in a couple of places in the canon, but you can't get too far from this whole question of the snake in the speckled band, because what we're told in the speckled band is that this, this terrible instrument of death was a swamp adder, but there really is no such animal that you can easily align with the jargon of swamp adder. And so this has led to a variety of great papers and expositions and speculation and writing and thinking about the true characteristics of the animal and the speckled, speckled band. And a great authority for that, of course, is the Scion Society, the Speckled Band of Boston. And Douglas Lawson of the Speckled Band wrote in the January 1954 edition of the Baker Street Journal a terrific paper about this. And his issue that he started with was how accurate was Holmes's statement that he solved the case by deduction. 
And the idea of Holmes says in the Speckled Band, he says, the idea of a snake instantly occurred to me when I coupled it with my knowledge that the doctor was furnished with a supply of creatures from India. And I felt I was properly on the right track. And the sight of the safe, the saucer of milk and the loop of whipcord was enough to dispel any doubts which might have remained. And, you know, one of the people, I, one, of, one of the great things that rise up at this point, among other things, is, well, wait a minute, snakes don't drink milk. But Lawson, you know, gets into these points and, and many other things. In fact, he got a hold of Dr. William Mann, the curator of Zoological Park in Washington, who said, no, no, uh, yes, I've seen many snakes drink milk, and that's just... A fallacy. So Lawson hmm. goes on from there. Holmes did solve the case by deduction, and, and snakes really do drink milk. But then you get to which species, which species of uh, snake could this possibly have been? And, um, you know, Watson tells us in his account of the story that the, that the animal in question had a puffed neck. And that poses another problem because the relevant species here do not really have puffed necks, et cetera, et cetera. So there are only two possible varieties, says Lawson, Russell's viper or Echis carinata. And uh, yeah, it's just a terrific paper. At the end of it, we're left with the conclusion that there were two snakes, a Russell's viper, which killed Julia Stoner. And uh, the reason why there were two snakes is a Russell's viper apparently does not live for more than a year in captivity. Hmm. And an Echis carinata, says Lawson, which embedded its fangs in a dead man as Roylet really died of a heart attack. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that, that would explain why the, the snake was more taken to milk rather than to Roylots in that case. <laughs> well, the snake had a low carb diet. You know, <laughs> it was keto. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And then Bill Baring Gould walked the same ground in um, volume 15, number three of the Baker Street Journal, where he summed up Lawson's paper and other papers. Uh, uh, another writer, Rolf Boswell, in, the, in a very early, the, the first edition of the Baker Street Journal, also thought there were two snakes. But um, Baron Gould proposed there was just one snake, a hybrid bred by Dr. Roylet in India, hmm. which I think is uh, highly unlikely. <laughs> Probably. Although, you know, we, we did mention that Dr. Roylet was a recipient of the Animal of the Month Club. So uh, <laughs> these could have been in rotation. Maybe there was a different snake when uh, Julia met her end. And uh, maybe there was a different snake when uh, Dr. Roylet met his end. They, they were on different ends of the rotation. Yes. Different ends of the bell pole. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Well, we will come back to talk more about wipers, vipers, and, well, maybe snipers, just after this brief word. In 2021, the BSI Press features three new volumes. That's right, three volumes, including one from the Manuscript Series, one from the profession Series, and one dedicated to the outgoing head of the BSI. First, the manuscript series, you'll hear about the Staunton tragedy, that is, the missing three-quarter. Mike Whalen, the former head of the BSI, has edited this book, in which a number of authors take aim at the missing three-quarter. You'll learn about rugby, you'll learn about the mystery, you'll learn about, well, many things in the latest manuscript series. And in the latest profession series, Michael Quigley and Marsha Pollock edit this volume that brings together corporals, colonels, and commissionaires as they look at military in the canon. And the third volume is A Quiet Air of Mastery, essays in honor of Mike Whalen as he steps down as the head of the Baker Street Irregulars. And that's edited by Les Klinger. All of these and more are available at BakerStreetIrregulars.com under the BSI Press section. Be sure to pick up your copy today. 
Well, we should also mention that uh, our sponsor, the BSI Press, has another book that is related to what we are about to talk about. And we'll mention that in just a moment. So this idea of wipers rather than vipers comes from the sign of four when Holmes sends Watson down to uh, Pynchon Lane to talk with um well, to, to get Toby's help, and he shows up looking for Mr. Toby. And um, Sherman, the uh, the handler of all of the animals at this, um, well, I, I don't know what you would call it. It's not quite a kennel. Um, maybe it's a Victorian animal rescue center, <laughs> given the description. Uh, because um, Pynchon Lane was a row of shabby two-storied brick houses in the lower quarter of Lambeth. I had to knock for some time on number three before I could make any impression. At last, however, there was the, the glint of a candle behind the blind, and a face looked out at the upper window. "'Go on, you drunken vagabond,' said the face. "'If you kick up any more, well, I'll open the kennels and let forty-three dogs upon you.' "'If you let one out, <laughs> it's just what I've come for,' said I." Go on, yelled the voice. So oh, help me gracious, I have a wiper in this bag and I'll drop it on your head if you don't hook it. <laughs> so, hello, Mr. Sherman. Nice to meet you. Um, so in this case, uh, wiper is merely a Cockney uh, pronunciation. As I, I wouldn't call it slang because it's not a, a substitute of another word, but it's just that, that East End of London pronunciation for viper. Um, which is, you know, I, when, when I first read the sign of four as a, as a young buck, uh, I kind of had to pause for a moment and say, well, what exactly is a wiper? You know, I mean, I know, uh, well, we, we know Russell's viper. I know intermittent wipers on my vehicle. <laughs> um, what is a wiper? And sure enough, it is, uh, just that East end pronunciation of viper. Well, you know, you're passing up an opportunity here to dig into a previously uncultivated oper um, bit of patch, bit of ground in Sherlockian lore, which was exactly what sort of business was Mr. Sherman running. It could be that he was providing intermittent wipers. He was providing <laughs> animals, animals to people who wanted the uh, joy of having the sort of menagerie that uh, Grimsby Roylet had, but couldn't afford it in their in their flat, you know, in their simple two room flat or one room flat in London. Instead, they would go and rent, you know, get the joy a weekend with the wiper, uh, you know, check out another animal because Watson, you know, comes to collect Toby. So apparently Sherman didn't have any problem lending out animals. He could have been, you know, the Hertz or the U-Haul of uh, of exotic animals in London and could be you know, the start of a previously unknown industry there. It's a shame there wasn't a franchise opportunity for anyone in those times. <laughs> What's wrong? What's wrong, Carol? You look a little down in the dumps today. Oh, yes, John, I was thinking our sitting room would be enlivened if we only had a parrot. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Carol, I'm going to nip down to Sherman's immediately. Yellow or blue? <laughs> oh, use your own judgment, George. <laughs> Well, it's it's interesting that uh, that Sherman would threaten Watson with uh, a wiper when, in fact, he had other creatures around that could have been just as terrifying. Terrifying. Um, Watson said uh, a, a stoat thrust its wicked head and red eyes through the bars of a cage, and um, and then uh, Sherman says, uh, "Don't mind that, sir. It's only a slow worm. He ain't got no <laughs> fangs. It'll give him the run of the room, for he keeps the beetles down." <laughs> Well, why didn't you let the viper have the run of the room to keep the beetles down rather than the slow worm? That's interesting. Yeah. Well, this this whole question of pronunciation, is it's a couple of things going on here. I mean, first of all, it is a literary caricature. You know, Dickens had his East Enders switching these two sounds, the V and the W. Mm. And I, I haven't read Pickwick Papers in years, but I remember in Pickwick Papers there's Sam... Weller and Sam Weller, if I remember all of his dialogue, is he's so he, he doesn't say his name is Sam Weller. He says, my name's Sam Vella. <laughs> and so, you know, for people like that, you've got veal is pronounced wheel and vinegar is pronounced vinegar and winter becomes vinter. But it comes, I think, I've always thought it comes from 
the German accent influence because the House of Hanover uh, became yeah. a British royal house in the early 18th century. When George I, you know, was the elector of Hanover who became George I. And, um, but, but I think it's, it's also a bit of a fraud because most speakers of English pronounce, um, you know, their, their V with a lot of friction between the lower lip and the upper teeth and, and German speakers of Germans pronounce the V with less friction. I don't think they're really pronouncing a W. I mean, it's just, it's not V as Americans would say. Mm. It's, you know, less friction. It's V. And, um, but, you know, so you've got this literary caricature and the sort of difference in, in pronunciation. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's a, uh, it's a fun caricature. Nonetheless, really gives you a sense of the character of Sherman, who was there with his his viper and and ready to uh, to do business. Now, I uh, should mention one more thing before we break, and this is related to our friends at the BSI Press. Um, Sherman did say viper, and this, to my mind, um, gave me a pause and made me think of the Wipers Times, which was a uh, a trench magazine. That was published by British soldiers in the trenches in World War I. Uh, of course, the, uh, the name Wipers Times uh, came from the location where they found the printing press, which was in Ypres. Uh, but, of course, Brits being Brits, they see Y-P-R-E-S, Ypres, uh, and uh, pronounced it as Wipers, classic Tommy slang, as they call it. And they, they produced the Wipers Times. Now, the reason we're mentioning this with respect to uh, Sherlock Holmes and uh, this particular podcast is because there was a uh, a publication that came out. And you had, you know, the Wipers Times had uh, advertisements, they had columns, they had poems, they had short stories, um, parodies, cartoons, you name it. But in in addition, there was actually some Sherlock Holmes material in there. And if you have been listening to I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, our most recent episode is an interview with, uh, is it Doug Peschel? Bill. Bill Peschel. Bill Peschel. Um, and, and, of course, he did some uh, – he, he cobbled together a number of Sherlock Holmes parodies. Well, in – uh, the the Wipers Times, one of the things that was of interest to them continually was uh, the dwindling supply of rum and whiskey. It was a major concern for everyone on the front. You know, when, when you were fighting Germans uh, across the trench, rats in the trench, uh, you know, water and mud and everything else, the, the least you could do is enjoy your drink. So if there was a disruption in the rum and whiskey supply, well, that was a big problem. And there was one serial story called Narpu Rum, and a certain Herlock Sholmes spent five issues tracking rum thieves in that particular <laughs> uh, run of the Wipers' time. So uh, the reason it's of interest to our friends at the BSI Press is, of course, a few years ago, uh, Trenches, the war service of Sherlock Holmes, was published by the BSI Press, uh, particularly looking at Sherlock Holmes and his work in The Last Bow and that manuscript. So it all comes back to Sherlock Holmes eventually, wipers or vipers or what have you. It's a great story, The Wipers Times, and our friend Glenn Maranker is among the many the several collectors of these original publications. And it's amazing that the soldiers in the front lines in World War I on the British side could find a printing press, could find paper, could write these stories and put out these little publications because there was a series of these these newsletters and, and publications that came out in different spots at different times and had the skill and we're able to do it. And then for entertainment, because there they are in the trenches and the front lines, absolutely, as you said, horrible conditions. So what could they do to amuse themselves? Parody Sherlock Holmes. Mm. And I think if I remember in that story that you mentioned, I think the solution to that mystery was the sergeant, if I remember. the Somebody was hoarding it, you know, some, some uh, 
a low grade officer or someone, some sergeant actually was keeping all the rum and cigarettes and things for himself. That would do it. He was, he was keeping the rum and the whiskey. (laughs) And that is just a trifle. It is, of course, a trifle, but there is nothing so important as trifles. Please join us again next week for another installment of Trifles. Show notes are available on SherlockHolmesPodcast.com. Please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts and be sure to check out our longer show, I Hear of Sherlock Everywhere, where we interview notable Sherlockians and share news of the Sherlockian world. You've taken my breath away, Mr. Holmes. Mr. Toby, Mr. Toby, get out of it, you drunken hooligan. Go on, get out of it, or turn my dogs on you, all 43 of them. I'm looking for Mr. Toby. I've got a wiper in this bag, and I'll tip it out over your head if you don't hook it. It's urgent that I find him. I won't be arguing with. One, two, three, and down comes your wiper. I've come for Mr. Sherlock Holmes.